and welcome to this episode of ERN's On Air, a quarterly bonus series of Rare On Air, the monthly podcast by Eurodis Rare Diseases Europe, where we take a deep dive into the operations of the European reference networks. I am your host, Rhiannon Walls, and in this episode, my colleague Rita Francisco and Mariette Driesens from the Dutch National Alliance will be diving into a conversation with Michelle Betty and Charlotte von Bezicom, comparing and contrasting the scope, governance, structure and goals of their respective organisations through the lens of their personal experiences as members of the coordination team. Hi everyone, my name is Rita Francisco and I am a survey manager at Eurodis. Joining me today as the special co-host of this ERNs on Air episode is Mariette Dressens. Mariette is a policy officer at VSOP, the Dutch National Alliance for Rare Diseases. Mariette is herself a Dutch national expert on the RNs, and she brings vast experience in supporting and bridging patient involvement in the RNs at national level. Mariette, welcome and thank you for joining me in co-hosting this special episode on the RNs. Hello all. It's a pleasure to be here with you too, Rita. But we are not alone. With us are our two illustrious guests. Featuring in this episode, we have Michelle Betty, who is a project manager in, in ERN Eurogen. This is the ERN that covers rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. And Charlotte van Beuzekom, who also works as project manager, but in a different ERN, endo ERN, that deals with rare endocrine diseases. Michelle, Charlotte, welcome. We are indeed very honored and lucky to have Charlotte and Michelle as our guests today, as our goal is to take advantage of Michelle and Charlotte's experience and do a compare and contrast exercise so that our listeners can understand how similar, but at the same time, how different the RNs are or can be from each other. And Charlotte, if that's okay, I would start this round with you. And I would like to start by asking you if you could share a little bit more about what you do as a member of EndoERN's coordination team and then if you could just very quickly walk us through what would be a typical workday for you. Well, so the endo ERN coordination team is based in Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and it currently consists of five persons. We've grown over time, and we are working on the day-to-day management of the ERN. As the endo ERN project manager, I have the pleasure and the responsibility to oversee and to coordinate this team. Since I started working as an ERN manager in 2017, from the start of the ERN, actually no day has been the same. So you ask me for a typical day, but that's actually impossible. But at the same time, that makes it a great adventure because every day brings new challenges. But to try to give it a little bit of structure, every week I have one-to-one meetings with my team members, with the team as a whole, but also topic-specific meetings with our collaborative partners in crime, like you, Eurodis, European Commission, our members, our steering committee, other ERNs, like Michelle and our peer ERM project managers, but also the institutional departments like finance control, HR, legal department. And apart from these meetings, of course, work has to be done. So writing applications, writing reports, budget control, keeping track on deadlines and organizing conferences and meetings is also taking quite some time. But as I said before, there's no typical working day. That's a really broad area of uh, activities and uh, many partners you have. How is that for you, uh, Michelle? Can you tell us a bit more about how is that in Eurogen? Yes, of course. I would definitely agree with Charlotte that no one day is ever exactly the same. Our coordination team, so we have 11 people right now and four of those are working on the ERN Eurogen registry and that some of those people work part time. We're split geographically. So we have one work stream leader in Hamburg in Germany and then there are three staff in the UK who are physically based in the UK, including myself as a leftover from the Brexit because our ERN was initially coordinated by a hospital in the UK and then we transferred the coordination from the UK hospital to Radboud University Medical Centre in Nijmegen. 
So the three team members in the UK work virtually from home. So I have my own office at home, which works well most of the time, except when my two little dogs try to join in with the virtual meetings, which can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. We have team working sessions at my house and we also regularly visit the hospital in Nijmegen to catch up with other team members. So as my job title is programme manager and I'm the responsible for all the management and coordination of the network at operational level. I do a lot of work on managing the grants and their implementation. I manage the UK-based staff members and make sure that they're okay working from home most of the time. I travel for meetings when needed and we have a weekly team meeting with our coordinator where we try to manage most of the work ongoing. And I should also say we have a very, very high volume of emails that need to be answered. And we do a lot of grant work and a lot of virtual meetings and a lot of dissemination presentations about the work we do. And I also introduce our weekly educational webinar program. So you are both very busy people working on multidisciplinary teams and basically multitasking a lot of the time, right? This is, I think, the common thread between both of your experiences. Mariette, do you like to add something? Yes, Michelle, you were mentioning the registry. That is something close to my heart since I do a lot of work on registries in the Netherlands as well. I wonder, I think this is very central and uh, like knowledge building tool, of course, for the ERNs. Uh, what are other kind of big achievements your network has attained so far? Would you like to highlight some of the projects? Yes, well, I, I will just continue with what you were saying about the registry. I mean, this is really very exciting because we know that one of the main problems with rare diseases is the lack of data and evidence and the little that we do have is fragmented. So the registries will give us the capacity to track the long-term outcomes of patients from childhood all the way through to adulthood for the very first time. Most of our conditions are detected or become apparent in infancy sometimes in babies, but the final outcomes are often evaluated post-puberty and indeed our patients need surgeries possibly throughout their lifetime. So with the registry, we'll really get the data that we need to make those improvements that we all want for patients. So the registry is very important. Other things for our ERNs that are real achievements, I think, well, for us, we have a great governance structure, as I mentioned, with the EPACs being fully involved. And I think that really helps with the network coordination. Another point, I think, is our collaboration with the scientific societies in our area. So, for example, the European Association of Urology has 18,000 members worldwide. So if we want to disseminate something, then we do it through them and we can reach all those members. And also, if we co-develop clinical guidelines with them, we know that the EAU guidelines are translated into 75 countries worldwide. So again, we can amplify our dissemination and our impact at national level through working with them. I would also like to mention the CPMS, which is a very important new tool for us, given to us by the European Commission. So this is the secure platform where ERN network members can discuss rare or complex cases. And this is very important because it means that the networks have the capacity to give highly specialised virtual advice to any healthcare provider in any member of the EU. So the advice is travelling and not the patient. Yes. Can I ask, so this is the clinical patient management system yes. that's being used to, to formulate this advice. And I was wondering, since you were telling that it was really the ERN that you have uh, surgical procedures. Patients undergo the very specialized surgical procedures. So does it sometimes happen that a patient travels from one country cross-border so to another country to have this procedure? Is that happening already? 
Yes. I mean, so uh, one example I can give you is, so we were contacted by a healthcare professional in Greece who wasn't sure whether or not what he was seeing in a patient was penile cancer, which can be a very aggressive and it's a very rare cancer. Most doctors won't come across it. It's very often misdiagnosed. So the network was able to confirm the diagnosis and the patient was transferred to another hospital where they had the expertise to deal with those kind of rare diseases. So yes, it does happen. But I I should make it clear that through the clinical patient management system, we are only giving advice to the treating clinician. It's up to them and indeed the patient in the hospital where they're being treated, what happens next. So if they want to go cross-border to access treatment, then that would happen under the usual processes and and legislation under the cross-border directive or the regulation on social security provisions. Thank you. So maybe over to you, Rita. Yeah, maybe I would direct the same question about the achievements to Charlotte, because Charlotte, like you said, you've been collaborating with Ender since 2017. So I'm sure you have contributed to several important achievements and you have celebrated many victories together in your team. But which ones would you like to highlight? Yes. So like I mentioned before, that endo is proud to have integrated our EPEX throughout all the layers of the network. This is exemplified by, for example, several scientific publications with EPEX as a first author or a co-author. We are very proud on that. And but they also co-present our webinars, which are part of our so-called Endoiran Academy. But also they have been able to give official presentations at Endoiran conferences, but also other European endocrinology conferences and symposia. They collaborate in guideline development, provide access to patient information, etc. A lot of the achievements actually align with what Michelle already mentioned regarding the CPMS and the webinars, and also about the collaboration with the European scientific societies. I would like to specifically specifically mentioned that over the past few years, both endocrine uh, scientific societies, so for adults, for adults and for the pediatrics, they have started a rare disease committee because the societies for endocrinology as a whole, so not only for the rare uh, conditions, but both societies have uh, installed a rare disease committee in which endoiran is represented. And based on a memorandum of understanding, we uh, mutually work on the improvement of care for rare endocrine conditions. So that's mainly, of course, that's not all, but that's just to highlight some achievements. Thank you so much for sharing that comprehensive and interesting list, if we may call it that, of achievements in projects. And we can see that there are a lot of common achievements all related to knowledge building, knowledge amplification and patient involvement across many important and transversal topics. So we talked about uh, achievements and we also would like to inquire a bit more about the, the remaining challenges. Can you give us some flavor what you would like to improve in the next couple of years? What are the goals? Well, for us, we would really like to have more patient representatives. So a shout out to all you patients out there who uh, might like to work with us. So please don't be shy and come forward. And also, I think I always find out uh, just by talking to people in general, that not many people outside the world of the ERNs know about the ERNs. And they're quite surprised about all of the work that we're doing. So I think we really need to have a bigger communication effort really with the outside world. I think that will be very important going forward. And also, I think this could be addressed uh, or should be addressed in the future by the joint action on integrating ERNs into member states' healthcare systems. Again, we can only provide advice to the people who know about us and request it. So I think that's a challenge and that's really important going forward. And then also a kind of personal reflection really a bit more about working in a virtual network. It can be a challenge and also a strength. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can react very fast to things by email, by virtual meetings, using the CPMS now. And 
the ERNs collectively had a fantastic response to the Ukrainian war as well. And we were instrumental in helping getting patients with rare diseases out of the Ukraine and into our healthcare providers. So that really demonstrated how fast we could react to a crisis challenge situation. But alongside that, it's important to make, we're all working at such pace and with so much responsibility that I think it's really important that we all look after everybody's well-being in the team and realise that we have to prioritise things effectively and understand that there's only so much that we can all do in one day. That's a beautiful, beautiful summary of challenges and also people management, working virtual over the whole of Europe. I'm really impressed. So over to you. Rita. Yeah, and also applicable, I think, to if not all, most of us and of our institutions, right? So that truly resonated with me, <laughs> I have to say. So I would ask also Charlotte about the main challenges you've faced so far are those or the challenges you have been experiencing similar to the ones that Michelle just described and also in terms of priorities for the future? Yes, well, in principle, I intended to say nothing to add to what Michelle just mentioned because <laughs> it was so well phrased. But well, for us, being a very big ERN, like I said, with uh, 111 members, it is a challenge to keep our members informed and involved. But on the other hand, if we succeed in personal contact and in focused contact, which leads to concrete results, it, it gives, first of all, a great satisfaction to both the specific expert center as well as the coordinator. But it also has a great potential to be disseminated to a very wide range of stakeholders. So that's a challenge and a goal in the same time. In terms of patient representation, we really try to get on board patient representation from the East Europe, it's still quite difficult to find them. One of the reasons could be that there's less patient organizations already structured. But I really like to stress that our current patient representatives are really offering their support on how to organize yourself, maybe as a single parent or a patient in a patient organization. So you could really start joining in if you're still very small and then make use of the, of the expertise within the network. Thank you for that. So communication challenges and opportunities, but hopefully this podcast in particular can be a small drop in that awareness ocean so that we can actually spread the word about the ERNs and reach other people that are still very unaware of what the ERNs are already doing. Brilliant. Thanks to both of you, Charlotte and Michelle, for that insightful conversation into the ERN system, what being an ERN manager means and what it entails on a daily basis. Thank you for pointing out the differences that set your ERNs apart, but also the commonalities that bring them together. If you are interested in getting more information on the ERNs, visit the, the Eurodis website. We will also add the hyperlinks to other relevant websites and resources in the description of this episode. You have been listening to an episode of ERNs on Air, a quarterly bonus series from Rare on Air, the monthly podcast by Eurodis Rare Diseases Europe. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, you can tune in once a month for our regularly scheduled episodes of Rare on Air, shining a light on the experiences, challenges and successes of the rare disease community. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. If there is a topic you would like us to discuss, you can contact us at rareonair at eurodis.org. We look forward to hearing from you.